Well, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Jesus, we thank you that you've revealed yourself to us. We thank you that because of the gift of your Holy Spirit, we can truly pray with faith and with love and say with all our hearts that Jesus Christ is Lord. We ask you to be with us tonight, Lord. We know that you made a promise that wherever two or three gather in your name, you're there. And Lord, we've certainly gathered in your name today, and we want you to be here. We want you to be our Lord. We want you to teach us, you to console us, you to challenge us, you to move in our hearts, you to give light to our minds and fire to our hearts. Amen. Well, just like Father Stephen almost told you about Pete Burrick falling asleep in class, I actually could tell you about Father Stephen almost falling asleep in class. Uh, Father Stephen was actually in a night class with me uh, not too long ago, and uh, he didn't fall asleep. <laughs> and he's a good student, and Pete's a good student. So part of my work is with Renewal Ministries, that ID 916 is one of the many things that we do with Renewal Ministries. And part of my work is at the seminary, uh, teaching there. It's a great seminary. Well, the topic for tonight is time, talent, and treasure. And I told Pete that I don't think I can really do a decent job on all three of those things in a half hour. So I said, Pete, would it be okay if I did treasure tonight and somebody else could do time and talent some other time? Because this is an important area of life. It's really amazing how much Jesus and the apostles teach about money. Now, I want to start by just reminding us what it means that Jesus is Lord, and who it is that we're really talking about, and whose teaching we're really going to try to listen to tonight. And I think the best way of doing it is tell you how I met him uh, very briefly. I mean, I met him, and I stayed with him, but very briefly, I'm going to tell you about it. I was a senior at Notre Dame, and I, I got caught up in the confusion of the culture, and uh, I was searching for the truth, and I, I kept switching majors from international relations to English to philosophy, and the more I studied philosophy, the more confused I got. Uh, you know, anyway. Uh, and then a friend invited me to make a weekend retreat, and I was extremely reluctant to go. I said, you know what? I don't think that when these people have a warm experience and call it God that I'm going to fall for it, you know? So I went on the retreat, and I heard these tremendous explanations of the Catholic faith, the beauty of creation, the beauty of redemption, uh, and then real estate agents and school teachers and janitors began to talk about Jesus. I said, well, that's kind of creepy. I mean... The, I mean, I mean, they're talking like he's right here, and, and they have a relationship with him. And then we all knelt down before the Blessed Sacrament in a little chapel, and one by one, people just began to speak to him. And then I began to get the distinct feeling like he was here, that the one that they were talking about was here. And... He wanted me to pay attention to him. And I began to really kind of struggle because if Jesus himself was there on that retreat, and if he was really inviting me to enter into a relationship with him, the lifelong plan I had for my life of continually enjoying searching for the truth forever and maybe never finding it was going to come to a sudden halt. I wasn't planning to find the truth so soon. I really wasn't, you know? <laughs> and then I really began to realize that maybe I was loving the seeking more than the finding and that Jesus himself was giving me a chance to find him right there and then. That's why sometimes when the scripture says, today if you hear his voice, harden not your heart. And I'd say that to you today. Today, if you hear his voice, 
harden not your heart because he's here too. Just like he was on that retreat, he's here too. But what really struck me was that if Jesus himself was there, if Jesus himself had risen from the dead, if he really was God, wow. The only sensible response was to fall at his feet and say, Lord, depart from me, a sinful man. Then, of course, when you say that to the Lord, he says, well, come on, get up. I'm going to make you a fisher of men. And I'm just trying to express as we begin tonight what it means that Jesus is Lord, like he's Lord. I wish I could say it more articulately, but Jesus is Lord. Do you, do you understand that, how, how important that is, that he's the Lord, he's God? And everything he says to us is so important. So we want to hear what he says about money. Now, I'm going to just go through some scriptures here. Now, what does the Catholic Church say about how we're supposed to relate to sacred scripture? In the Constitution on Divine Revelation from Vatican II, it says that everything asserted by the sacred authors should be considered to be asserted by the Holy Spirit and to teach firmly, faithfully, and without error those truths which God wished to consign to the sacred writings for the sake of our salvation. I'm going to take my jacket off because you got the heat on here tonight. That, that's good. It's good you have the heat on. So that's a pretty strong statement about how to take sacred scripture. Everything asserted by the sacred writers should be considered to be asserted by the Holy Spirit and to teach firmly, faithfully, and without error those truths which God wished to consign to the sacred writings for the sake of our salvation. So this is here for our salvation. And this is coming from the Lord, and this is coming from the Holy Spirit. Now, one of the greatest competitors to the lordship of Christ, spiritual writers pick out three things. They talk about money, sex, and power. These are strong drives in human beings. They're strong, almost unconscious desires that lead us in a certain direction, and they're competitors to the lordship of Christ unless they're in harmony with his lordship. So one of the things it means to be a disciple, one of the things, the pillars of, of ID 916 conversion is ongoing conversion, ongoing bringing our life more and more into harmony with the teaching of Christ, with the person of Christ, more and more wanting him to be Lord of our life. And it doesn't happen all at once. It really is a lifelong process. I'm still finding parts of my life that I'm opening to the Lord that I didn't know was closed to the Lord. There's just more and more and more that's possible in terms of our union with the Lord and our surrender to him. So let's take a look at money. Let's take a look at the treasure part of that time, money, uh, time, talent, and treasure. Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. This is Jesus talking. No person can serve two masters. He will either hate one and love the other, or be attentive to one and despise the other. You cannot give yourself to God and money. One's going to be the controlling thing in your life. It's going to be God or money. Mark chapter 10, verse 23. Similar passage in Matthew chapter 20, 19, verse 24. And these scripture passages I'm going to be sharing with you tonight aren't things that can be absorbed in an instant. There are things worthwhile meditating on. There are things that have to kind of take, take root in our minds and hearts with the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. Of course, the disciples were shocked at this. They said, well, Lord, who could be saved? And Jesus said, well, with man, it's, it's impossible. But with God, we can find a way. We can even find a way for rich people to get into the kingdom of God. So we can do it with the Lord. And there's lots of scriptures about instruction that the Lord gives to those who are rich. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10. The love of money is the root of all evil, 
and some men in their passion for it have strayed from the faith and have come to grief amid great pain. So it isn't that money is the root of all evil, but the excessive disordered love for money becomes the root for all evil because people start cheating, they, keep, they start lying, they do unjust things, they, they cut corners, they make deals, things like that. Luke chapter 12, verse 15. Avoid greed in all its forms. A man may be wealthy, but his possessions do not guarantee him life. So one of the things that Jesus is teaching his disciples is you got to hold on to wealth a little lightly, just like you need to hold on everything into your life a little lightly. You need to keep giving it to the Lord. You need to keep surrendering it to the Lord. Greed is actually listed as one of the serious sins that can exclude people from the kingdom of God. It can become that serious. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Sometimes greed is likened to idolatry. Colossians chapter 3, verse 5. And here's Paul's basic advice about our money, our attitude towards money. We brought nothing into this world nor have we the power to take anything out of it. If we have food and clothing, we have all that we need. Those who want to be rich are falling into temptation and a trap. They are letting themselves be captured by foolish and harmful desires which drag men down to ruin and destruction. One more passage. This is a challenging passage. It's also a liberating passage. It's a life-giving passage. Hebrews chapter 13, verses 5 and 6. I bet you didn't know there was something exciting in Hebrews chapter 13. Keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. What? Be content with what we have, but hey, we hardly have anything sometimes, right? Some of us here hardly can pay our rent, right? Some of us here can hardly pay our tuition. Some of us here can hardly afford to pay insurance on our car, right? How can somebody in that situation be content with what they have? I mean, if we were Tom Monahan and owned Domino's Farms, we could maybe be content with that, right? But listen to this. Keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have because he has said. So what has the Lord said that can make us content with what we have? This is it. I will never abandon you, nor will I forsake you. Therefore, we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can human beings do to me? You know, some people say, you know what? I, I know the mayor. I can get your parking ticket fixed, you know? Or, you know, I, I know the guy who runs the gas station. You know, next time they have an energy crisis, you know, I, I think I can get some gas for us, you know? Or, you know, I, I know somebody who can get you into law school, you know? You know what? We all know the Lord. And that's more important than knowing the mayor or the gas station owner. We know the Lord. And you know what the Lord has said to us? I will never abandon you nor forsake you. And you know what that does for us? It gives us a freedom and a joy and a confidence so that we can say, the Lord is my helper. I just kind of one up the guy who hadn't knew the mayor, you know. The, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid what can human beings do to me? A Christian can't lose, right? For those who love God, everything works according to the good. A Christian can't lose. Whether we live or die, we can't lose if we're in Christ and if he's our Lord. Now, how is this really possible? Well, I'll tell you. In my work, I meet wealthy people sometimes. I've met really wealthy people who have millions and millions of dollars, but don't think they have enough to begin giving to the church. Truly, really. Or I know people with lots and lots of money 
who are so afraid of losing it that they can't give. And then I have the opposite experience. I remember one time I was in India, and they took me out to a little village. And I think it was the first time the villagers had ever seen somebody from America, and they were really excited. And they, they got together in a little huddle, and they started talking to each other, and they were, they were really, really happy, and then somebody ran off, and they said, wait, 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 we got something for you. Somebody ran off, and about 20 minutes later, they came back with a bottle of Coca-Cola. And with tremendous excitement, they gave it to me. I can't tell you how, how moved I was by that. It reminded me of when King David's men went behind enemy lions to, to get him a drink of water from his favorite spring that was under enemy control, and they brought it back to David, and he was so moved by what they did, he didn't want to drink it, and he really disappointed them. He poured it in the ground. He said, I can't do it. You pay too great a price. But I knew that I needed to take that Coca-Cola, even though it was the collective wealth of the village. They pooled their resources to buy me a bottle of Coca-Cola, and they were so happy to do it. Being content with what we have isn't a function of how much we have. It's a function of who we know. It's a function of the relationship we have with the Lord himself. Now, a little personal testimony. Uh, when my wife and myself got married, we got six children and just jumped from 14 to 16 grandchildren in the last couple months. Uh, I only had a part-time job, and I just got fired from St. John's Student Center in East Lansing because of the charismatic renewal breaking out. And I was digging sewer lines in Williamston, Michigan, and then we got hired at St. Mary's Chapel, but not at a very high wage, shall we say. And my wife was a lab tech at University of Michigan, but you know we were pregnant with our first baby, and she was going to have to stop work. And we were kind of wondering how this was going to work because... I wasn't making enough really to handle things. And so one day she stopped at St. Mary's on the way home from the hospital and she says, I'm not leaving, Lord, until you let me know whether this is going to work out or not. I was back in our one bedroom apartment on Monroe Street, right across from South Quad, praying the same prayer like, Lord, help, what's going to happen? And I had this absolutely strong experience of God the Father saying, I'm your father. I'm your father. You can rely on me. You can trust me. I'm your father. And my wife had the same sense when she was praying in St. Mary's Chapel. So she came home and she told me what she experienced. I told her what we experienced. And we didn't know how it was all going to work, but we knew that God the Father had assured us of his care. And hey, you know, we're, we're not homeless, you know, where things are working out, you know, we're, you know, the Lord has blessed us in so many different ways. But I remember sitting on the floor of our apartment right above Campus Corner Drugstore on the corner of State and Packard. Hardly any furniture. Three other guys, they were out. And I was just praying, and I felt like the Lord told me, I'm going to give you a scripture passage which you need to make the key scripture passage in your life. Luke chapter 12. Unbelievers are always worried about what they're going to eat and what they're going to wear, what the future is going to bring. But I say to you, seek first the kingdom of God and his holiness, and these other things will be added as well, because your heavenly Father knows you need them. This isn't the prosperity gospel. This is not the promise of getting a, Catholic, a Cadillac or a Mercedes. This is a promise that God the Father is going to give us what we need to carry out the mission for which he's created us. I can't tell you enough how important it is to take seriously these words of Jesus. Seek first the kingdom of God and his holiness, and these other things will be added as well. If you put the first things in the first place, the second things are going to work out really well. If you try to put a second place thing in the first place, it's going to be tremendous strain and frustration, and it's not going to work. Now, how is all this possible? Well, let me tell you how we started to deal with the question of tithing. What, what's tithing? Tithing was an Old Testament requirement. 
you had to give the first 10 percent of your income of the produce of your fields to the Lord it is not a requirement in the New Testament but the New Testament isn't something to be less grateful for than what the Old Testament was there's even a greater price that's been paid for us there's a greater deed that's been done for us the deed of Jesus's death on the cross for us and so generous giving is encouraged throughout the New Testament we'll get to some of the particular text my wife and I myself knew these scripture passages and we were part of a community where we were trying to follow Jesus as disciples when we got married we borrowed a car for our honeymoon it was a Corvair not a Corvette <laughs> and Ralph Nader later wrote a book called unsafe at any speed that was the car we had for our honeymoon unsafe at any speed and all our worldly possessions fit into the trunk which was very small it was in the front as I recall and then when we got back from our honeymoon, we, we were in an apartment on Thompson Street, right where St. Mary's is, and with three other couples that had just gotten married too, we shared one very used car. That's how we started. We didn't have a lot, but we started tithing. We started giving 10% of what we had, even though we didn't have much. And that's been a practice in our life for 40 or 50 years. I haven't counted. It's somewhere in there. Pete was in the ballpark, definitely. How is this possible? It's knowing the Father's love. It's knowing the Father's love. It's gratitude for the sacrifice of Jesus. It's wanting to follow the teaching of Jesus. Jesus says, Do not be afraid any longer, little flock. For your father is pleased to give you the kingdom. Sell your belongings and give alms. Provide money bags for yourselves that do not wear out. An inexhaustible treasure in heaven that no thief can reach nor moth destroy. For where your treasure is, there also will your heart be. Now, St. Francis de Sales, who wrote the first book of spirituality for lay people, Introduction to Devout Life, has tremendous wisdom about how to make this concrete. How do you know you're not fooling yourself about your relationship to money? How do you know that you're letting Jesus really be Lord of your finances? And he kind of talks about some of the ways that we can deceive ourselves in this area and some of the practical steps we can take to keep turning this area over to the Lord. The first thing he says is that waiting till you have enough is a delusion. You're never going to feel like you have enough. He says, start where you are being generous with what you have. The second thing he has, says is a way of understanding where your heart is. What happens to you when you lose money? Do you freak out? Do you kind of feel like the end of the world has come? Do you feel like what a horrible thing has just happened to me? say an investment or stealing or you lose money what happens to your heart are you so attached to that money that that you're kind of it's really disturbing your whole life or is it something that you can continue to move beyond trusting God the Father to provide quote he says if you find your heart very desolated and afflicted at the loss of property believe me you love it too much the strongest proof of love for a lost object is suffering over its loss. Accept your losses meekly, patiently, availing yourself of the opportunity to live more simply. One of the things that the Apostle Paul said is, I know how to handle the want, and I know how to handle abundance. I know how to abase, and I know how to abound. A certain detachment, a certain freedom, a certain kind of leaving in God's hands, whether he's going to give us a lot of money or not. St. Catherine of Siena says, the Lord gives a lot of money to people who he knows can handle it well. And if, if he's not giving you a lot of money, it's because he maybe is caring for your soul, that you, may, you wouldn't handle it so well. Now, obviously, this isn't a, a universal principle. He's talking about those who are disciples. Another thing Francis says, he says, you are truly avaricious if you longingly ardently anxiously desire to possess goods that you do not have 
even though you say that you would not want to acquire them by unjust means. I'm taking this from uh, chapter 10 of, of the Fulfillment of All Desire. The last time I was here, I, I spoke on that. I know a number of you have read it. It's, it's about growing in freedom, and he has tremendous stuff about, about money and other things. Now, Scripture also has advice to people who are wealthy. 1 Timothy chapter 6. Tell those who are rich in this world's goods not to be proud and not to rely on so uncertain a thing as wealth. Let them trust in the God who provides us richly with all things for our use. Charge them to do good, to be rich in good works, and generously sharing what they have. Thus they will build a secure foundation for the future for receiving that life which is life indeed. There's another interesting place in Scripture, Romans chapter 12, where it says about all the gifts that the Holy Spirit gives to the body of Christ. One of the gifts, besides teaching and prophecy and administration and helps, is the gift of giving money generously. Now, because Renewal Ministries is dependent on donations from people who believe in our work, we've met some amazing people over the years, people who pray each year in January about what the Lord wants them to do with their money and how much they should give and who they should give it to. And we've received a check from people like this right on the day we need that amount. They just are tuned in to Jesus being Lord of their resources and their giving under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, and they're a tremendous blessing to the body of Christ. Some have the gift of making money and giving it generously. Now, There's a saying that I've heard over the years that you can't outdo God in generosity. Malachi chapter 3, verses 8 to 12. Dare a man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. And you say, how do we rob you? In tithes and in offerings. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse and try me in this, says the Lord of hosts. Shall I not open for you the floodgates of heaven to pour down blessing upon you without measure? So the Lord, through the prophet Malachi, said, Come on, guys, don't, don't stint on what you're giving to the Lord, you know? Try the Lord. See, it, see if you can outdo him in generosity. Bring the whole tithe into the barn and, and see if I don't open for you the floodgates of heaven. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 9 and 10. Honor the Lord with your wealth with the first fruits of all your produce. Then will your barns be filled with grain, with new wine your vats will overflow. Again, the, you can't outdo God in generosity. It's a biblical principle. Luke chapter 6, verse 38. Given it shall be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. Will they pour into the folds of your garment? For the measure you measure with will be measured back to you. 2 Corinthians chapter 9. He who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. How, do, how does my wife and I handle this? We try to give 10% of everything that we receive. We divide it roughly 5%, 5%. We give 5% to the parishes that we go to. We do go to more than one parish, uh, and we try to reflect our giving by the proportion of what we, do, what we go to. Uh, and then we give the other 5% to uh, ministries that, that have, have blessed us or are blessing other people. And, uh, and then we give alms sometimes too, you know, like beyond the 10%, like Anyway, and then we're also helping uh, grandchildren who have parents who don't have a lot of money go to Catholic school. So, you know, we're just trying to pass on what the Lord is giving us. And I, I, I have to tell you, sometimes I'll look at our checking account. I'll say, where did this money come from? Honestly, I mean, I remember in the early days when we were really very, you know, experiencing a lot of blessing of the Lord. Uh, sometimes we'd be serving meals, you know, we thought we didn't have enough food, but honestly, the food was multiplying. It really was. And, and it will sometime. It just, it just kept coming. 
is sometimes I'll look at our checking account and i say, where did this come from? Now, maybe I could figure it all out, but I don't think I could. I, I, something's happening. And let me just end with, with an example of something that just happened recently. About a year and a half ago, um, we got a fundraising appeal from a ministry we know in New York City, in the Bronx. And they, they serve people uh, physical needs, and they also evangelize. And they have this humble little newsletter, you know, no color, no real designer, you know, uh, kind of mimeographed, kind of, you know, poor newsletter for a poor ministry. And, and they're talking about their needs. They say, you know, we need $200 to give Bibles to kids that we're, we're serving on the streets of New York. But we just had a terrible setback in what happened to us. Uh, our whole computer system was, was stolen. And we need $5,000 to get it all back together again and hire somebody who can do that. So normally when my wife and I get an appeal, we, we, we talk together, and we usually come up with the identical amount. We both have the same sense about what we should give. So she asked me, what do you think we should give? I said, I think we should give $200 for the Bible. I said, what do you think? She said, I think we should give $5,000 for the computer system. I said, oh. <laughs> I said, we don't have that out of current income, you know. We'd have to take it out of retirement savings. She said, take it out of retirement savings. So I, I honored her sense of what we should do, you know, erring on the side of generosity. A lot more than the $200 I felt we should give. So wrote our check of $5,000, sent it off. Two days later, we got a telephone call from St. Louis Center in Chelsea for developmentally disabled children, and we, we donate there too, and we, uh, uh, we bought some raffle tickets, you know? And, and so we got a telephone call saying, you won the raffle for the Alaskan cruise, and it's worth $7,500. We said, you, you got to be kidding. What, I mean, this is a joke. Who's calling, you know? <laughs> it was, we had bought raffle tickets, I think in this room at a Legatus meeting, for an Alaskan cruise. And we've always wanted to do an Alaskan cruise. And this was like a super-duper Alaskan cruise. You know, it was the cruise, and it was the land thing, and going to Denali National Park. And so $7,500, and all we could think of is, you can't outdo the Lord in generosity. Just amazing. It doesn't happen like that all the time, but I can't tell you how much the Lord has blessed us like he says he will bless those who follow him as a disciple. And I'm not holding myself up as a model. I'm just a guy trying to pay attention to what Jesus says and understanding that it's the Lord who's speaking to us. So I'd recommend, if you're not already tithing, to start doing it. Even if you hardly have any money and see what the Lord will do. Amen. Thank you very much, Ralph. I always feel inspired after hearing your words. I'm like, gosh, who can I write a check to now? <laughs> I want to go to Europe. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> All right. We're going to take some time now to break up into our table groups and have a discussion time. Uh, Pete, do you have questions to hand out? to the? Okay, great. So questions are coming around, and the chapters, the questions are posted on Facebook, so you guys can also join in and go through those. And So we'll take some time to do that, and then we'll come back together for some Q&A.
Was it good? Oh, good. Yeah? <laughs> Very good. All right, we're going to bring it back together so we can have some time to ask Dr. Martin some questions. So if you have any questions out in the live stream world, please tweet us at ID916, and we'll, we'll do our best to get to them. We've got about 10 to 12 minutes for, for questions, give or take two minutes. Uh, if you have a question in the room, please come line up on this side. Tonight we only have one microphone, so we're going to do a little bit of a handoff thing. So Ralph, if you could come back up, that'd be great. And then once a question appears, we'll have them speak into it, and then we'll go from there. Okay. Oh, it looks like Sal's got a question. Sal, do you have a question? Okay, so you can, yep, good. Well, well thank you for your talk. Yeah, do I stand you, right here? Get on camera here? Okay. So, yeah, yeah. Hey, everyone. Hello, hello. Hey, Pittsburgh. I know some of you there. All right. So I got a, I got a couple questions. Liberality. That's, that's tied into this, right? I know it wasn't really mentioned because it's, it's one of the virtues, right? And then also when it comes to, we talked about wealth. What about debt? And about what the church has to say about debt and, and that with wanting to be generous too. So... Yeah, well, the Romans 12 passage where it says some, have the, some people have the gift of giving money generously is sometimes translated liberal, liberal liberality, and uh, so that's, that's definitely there. Uh, there's also the thing that Scripture says about God loves a cheerful giver. Like, you may grit your teeth a little bit when you're writing your tithe check, but after you write it, you're going to feel really good. You know, you know it's, it, there's something really good about getting out of yourself and using your, some of your resources to help somebody else. It's just really good, even though it takes a little act of courage, it, maybe it's a little painful to, to, to give it right away, but it kind of, there's, there's a joy to it. God loves a cheerful giver. What does the church say about debt? I don't know what the church says about debt. Do you, do you know what the church says about that? No. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Right, right, yeah. Yeah, I don't think we want to acquire debt. I think we want to pay off debt and try not to go into debt. That's, that's my simple answer. Yeah, I, I don't know. I'd have to take a look at that, you know? Yeah, yeah. So, any guidance for those of us living off of student loans and who will be paying back their, that debt for decades? Vote for Bernie Sanders. <laughs> no, I'm just, I'm just, you know, doesn't Ber Bernie says that nobody's going to have to pay for education, right? You know, I, I'm just kidding. I mean, you know that, don't you, really? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> you know, I th <laughs> who wants to answer her question? You know, who has student debt and, and who wants to say something to her? I think you just kind of pay it off as best you can. You could extend payment, you know, and I mean, we incurred the debt, so we should try to pay it off, right? I mean, that's, that's what we should do. And yes, it's, you know, not a great situation, but we borrowed money and we should pay it back and, um, it, you know, ask the Lord to provide you enough money to pay back your debt, you know? I have a feeling that that there's something more personal here that you want to talk about that I, I can't satisfy. You come up here, Joey. Come on up here. Come on up here, Joey. You, you, no, that's okay. You, 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 yeah, I, I, yeah I, th I think you understand her question better. I don't know how I ended up here. I feel like I'm the guy, I'm the guy that was walking down the street of the party and they just pulled in. Um, no, it would seem like that if you had, like those of us who are in debt, which is probably almost everybody in this room, that they've accrued from, from school in some way um, or a house and stuff like that. I don't know, one thing strikes me, Ralph, let's just have a conversation about this. One thing that strikes me is that debt in nowadays, as opposed to 40 years when you were our age, is probably not the same thing. Debt is just kind of, for better or for worse, it's, a, it's just another bill that you have to pay, you know? 
it's not it's not really debt like mafia kind of debt where it's like <laughs> I better my kneecaps are gonna be smashed if I don't pay this off. Um, so I don't know. In a certain sense, it's just you, you, it's like if it's just another bill to pay, then you just kind of lay out all your finances, um, still give God the first fruits, and if that means you have to fully pay off your debts five years later in your life or even ten years later, I don't know. Um, but I I also feel like th this is a certain way in which we can uh, really make radical and real the faith that God no one gives out, out gives God in generosity. Um, that like we we won't be um, we won't be uh, drowned in that debt. Um, yeah, it won't, it won't drown us even if we do decide to tithe. Um, but I think bottom line, it's just another bill to pay. And so you can still, it's just, just like, it's like anything else. It's like a grocery bill. So you can tithe in the midst of it. Those are my very humble thoughts. <laughs> Isn't it amazing what a guy you just drag in from the street can say? Yeah. Uh, let me say one other thing. And I, I don't, I don't want anybody to abuse this, but if if you don't have the faith to do ten percent, start start lower. You know, if you if you comfortably can do five percent, but you just don't have the faith to to do ten percent, start start with something. You know, uh, I was just giving a, a talk in Florida at the Legatus National Summit, and Rick Warren was there. You know, some of you know him. He, he wrote The Purpose Driven Life. He's got this huge church in California. He has 400,000 ministers that he's mentoring. He and his wife started off tithing, but they decided to increase it every year of their marriage, the percentage that they were giving. Some years they could only increase it by like 0.2 tenths of a percent, you know? But now they're up to giving 91% of their income and keeping 9%. So it's just so inspiring to run into people like Rick Warren. But if you don't have the faith for that, or you don't have the faith for 10%, start with what you feel like the Lord's giving you the grace for, and, and do that. Hi, Professor Martin. Do we need to have people on camera? Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah, okay. All right. See, this is Colin from Ann Arbor. Yeah. Hi. Okay. Hello. Uh, so, Dr. Ralph Martin, uh, this this quotation from the letter to the Hebrews sounds kind of uplift uplifting, but when I ponder it, it, to me it seems like an empty promise from God when he says, I will never fail you <clears throat> nor forsake you because he doesn't have to do anything to keep this promise. Um, what I mean is, we could die a miserable death, <clears throat> having given all our money, and his promise, he would still make good in his promise, because he has nothing to do, except for maybe, um, or maybe he's already done it. And maybe our reward is nothing but heaven. So is there anything, can we take this promise as any, that can we, can God make good on this promise while we're on earth? Yeah, I think the promise is about why we're on earth. The promise is about right now, being content with what we have right now, and knowing that God's not going to not give us what we need to carry out the purpose and mission for which we've been created. There's other promises, too. It says that anybody who's left, you know, brothers or sisters or family or fields for my sake is going to get a hundredfold in this life. You know, so all these promises are about blessings in this life. I mean, they're all about, uh, the Lord says, try me. See if you can outdo me in generosity. It's about, it's about being blessed in this life. It can be abused, though, because we're not giving to get. But we are going to get. But we're not giving to get. We're giving to worship God. We're giving to show gratitude to him. We're, we're giving because Jesus is asking us to do practical things that will show that our heart is not wrapped around our, our riches. But this is all about blessing in this life. But it can be abused. You know, that's, that's where the prosperity gospel comes in. And, you know, you know, these TV evangelists, you know, who say, you know, if you give this seed money, you know, you're going to get, you know, next week, you know, you're going to get a check in the mail from God, you know. So it's, it's abused sometimes, but it's, it's there. It's there. So you're going to be blessed in this life. So go ahead and tithe. Go ahead and get blessed. Oh, that's tremendous. The greatest blessing would be to die a martyr, right? Go right to heaven. It couldn't be a greater blessing. 
Yeah. Yeah. Good. Okay. <laughs> okay, good. Hello. Hello, everyone. Um, for those of you that don't know, my name's Bethany. I, I missed the name tag. I don't know how, but I, I don't have one. So I'm Bethany. Anyways, Ralph, my question for you comes up with uh, regarding where do you where do you draw the line? So when I look at my life, I think of all of the blessings that I have. I mean, I have a roof over my head. I have food to eat. I have a, a great car. It's reliable. I have enough money to take care of myself and my friends and, and be generous. But but could I live in a shack and, and drive a crappy car and, and, and not have like five pairs of clothes, just one, you know? <laughs> I have more than five pairs of clothes. <laughs> <laughs> but but I mean I I could get by with one and, and wash it or two or something. <laughs> anyway, that's not what my question's about. The question's about where do you where do you draw that line and how do you feel comfortable with, with how generous you are to know that, that God is happy with what you're giving? The only answer to this is to be led by the Holy Spirit. There's no rule or principle. There's no one answer for everybody. It's trying to keep your heart open to the Lord so the Lord can inspire you and move you. And you've made a good point, though. The folks in this room are living at a higher level of living standard than almost every generation in the history of the world. We have indoor plumbing. <laughs> Do you realize how special that is? We have hot water. You know, we have cars. You know, I mean, we have, you know, I mean, we have clothes, you know? I mean, like, it's, it's like, I mean, we are, we are, uh, people these days sometimes don't think they can get married unless they already have enough money for a house and they have this, you know, done and that done. They can't have children until they've saved up $200,000 because they read on the internet that you need $200,000 for every child, you know, to educate them. It's not true. We never had $200,000 before we had babies, and they're tremendous, and the Lord blessed us with them, and it's a great blessing. So, but, but how you should live in your standard of living is something you need to just keep submitting to the Lord and be guided by Him. And if you, there's a basic peace in your life and uh, things like seem like they're working like they should, you, you need to dress a certain way for your job. You, know? you need to dress a certain way to relate to people and all that kind of stuff. If you wore sackcloth and ashes, people might not pay so attention to what you're saying anymore or something like that. So be led by the Holy Spirit. Thank you. <laughs> Hi. Um. You know where I see Kirsten? In Mr. Monahan's office. <laughs> she, she's there. I guess I just wanted to piggyback a little bit on what um, Colin was saying, just that if, if that promise is about blessing in this life, then, um, but we do know in this world that there are people who do die because they're so poor. You know, they, they, they die of starvation. Maybe not so common here, but very common in the world. So does that mean that those people were not Christian, or how would that passage be true in their lives? It's amazing how happy poor people can be They're often much happier than us. We, we do mission work all over the world, and we see people who have nothing spending five hours at a mass, uh, worshiping the Lord, you know? Uh, yes, there's diseases, there's illness, there's premature death, but life is short, and there's only one thing necessary. Your life is a tremendous success if you die in friendship with the Lord. Your life is an incredible failure no matter how much money you have and how long you live and how, what prestige and jobs you have if you die an enemy of the Lord, an enemy of the cross of Christ. So we, 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 we can't judge justice. We can't judge blessing just by whether the person lives a long life or not, whether they have money or not. 
it's it's their life is a success if their heart is with the Lord, and the Lord is giving them everything they need for as long as they need to live in order to to love Him and to serve Him. So I can't answer all those questions, uh, but there's um, the thing I come back to when I can't explain things is that all His ways are true, all His ways are just, all His ways are fair. All his words are are reliable, and so I believe uh, that God is absolutely just and absolutely generous with every person on the face of the earth. And I can't demonstrate that, but I, I, I know it's true. And when we get to the other side, when we get to the other side, we're not going to have any arguments whatsoever with how God did things. We're going to just fall down in absolute amazement at the incredible plan of God, his incredible generosity, and his incredible justice, and incredible mercy. For sure, for sure. It's all going to make sense in a way that it can never make sense completely on this side of the veil.